would like to do a, a small introduction of our speaker. Actually, I, we are probably don't need to do much introduction. The fact that you choose this course, it's, I think, a good part is because of the lecture also. So, uh, but uh, we are really, uh, you know, in the summer school, I try to invite lecturers who are not only good researchers, but also good lecturers. So I'm really very happy this time we can have uh, Professor Heinz Pitch. To, to, to give us the lecture. And uh, uh, the distinguishing feature of Professor Pitts of what he can offer, you can soon you'll find out it's not only you know, combustion fundamentals, the, the very basics. That will include actually turbulent combustion, laminar combustion, turbulent combustion, and also combustion chemistry, practical combustion, and, uh, and, and the whole works. But also, it's, it's very inclusive in the sense that he has experience at Stanford. He's taught at Stanford before he went to his present position in Aachen. So he's an internationalist. He knows the tender feelings of the US students, maybe certain times, and, uh, and, 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 the, and the European tradition. So uh, that uh, it'll be 15 hour lecture. And uh, you know, I, I'm sure by the end of, the, end of Friday, you, you feel very, very satisfied. And another thing I want to say is that you will see in the years to come, uh, Professor Pitch's uh, influence in this area because past few years, a large number of his students are populating the highest level of uh, U.S. academic uh, faculty. Right? So his gospel will be propagated down for a long time. So, and uh, you are the, one of the you know beneficiaries of of, 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 of his knowledge. Okay, Professor Pitch. Thank you, uh, Ed, for the uh, kind words. So I learned from this. You, uh, yeah. So I learned from this, you uh, uh, become a professor, you uh, graduate a few PhD students, and then uh, you can stop working and let the students do all the work. So um, welcome to this um, uh, course on uh, combustion theory. Uh, this course is uh, meant to uh, give you some fundamentals in um, uh, combustion. Uh, it's, uh, we have 10 lectures. Uh, two per day, and um, it's actually quite short. So um, uh, we, I do assume that you have some uh, knowledge about certain things, and um, I'll show you later uh, what I mean by that. So I want to give you a start out, uh, giving you a, um, a short introduction uh, before I uh, tell you what this course in particular is about. So combustion uh, is uh, special. And um, it says here is a mass and energy uh, conversion process. But um, so combustion involves uh, chemistry and chemical reactions. But not every process that involves chemistry and chemical reactions is combustion. So what's special about combustion? Now, we have only 15 hours, and so time is short. Uh, you guys come here, you uh, want to work hard, learn a lot. I come here, you know, want to be efficient. So when I ask you questions, I will ask you questions all the time, hopefully. And um, if I don't get too self-absorbed here yeah, in front. Um, but I want quick answers, and they don't need to be right. I just want to, you know, have some Discussion actually is sometimes good if you give the wrong answer, then um, gives me a chance to uh, you know uh, uh, really tell you um, uh, what I mean. Understanding why one gives the wrong answer sometimes teaches you more than uh, just give the wrong the right answer. Okay, so what's special about combustion? <coughs> the heat release, right? So I'm uh, uh, preaching to the choir here, obviously. Um, you should give fast answers, not, but all, not always right. You should give wrong answers. No, I'm joking. Uh, so so the, what's special about combustion is there's heat release. The heat release, so that's not all of it. Um, uh, the second part that's important is chemical reactions typically depend on temperature. Reaction rates depend on temperature. They depend exponentially on temperature. So they are very, very strongly temperature uh, dependent, uh, temperature sensitive. The higher the temperature, typically the faster the reactions are. 
And so if you have a chemical reaction that um, uh, leads to heat release, it will heat up the uh, mixture, will lead to a temperature increase, and that temperature increase will make that reaction faster, which leads to more heat release and so on. So it's a nonlinear feedback that uh, leads to a combustion process. This nonlinear feedback um, leads to the fact that combustion very often uh, or, or always is um, a very nonlinear process. And you know that nonlinear uh, processes have multiple solutions and so on. So one thing that is very obvious, and you all know it, is that, um, is that um, uh, is these multiple solutions. So for example, you have a candle flame, and the candle is burning, and you just let it go by itself, and it will keep burning until the candle is gone. But if you put the candle outside, then um, uh, you know sometimes you have some wind, and the wind might extinguish the flame. And once it's extinguished, it will never come on by itself. Okay. So you have the same system, but um, you have two different solutions, one burning and one's not burning. OK, so that's very important. Uh, you see this here. In combustion, we transfer uh, chemical bond energy into thermal energy. And uh, fuel reacts typically uh, here with oxygen of the air uh, into products. Uh, we mainly form carbon dioxide and water. And uh, the products have lower enthalpy of formation and the reactants, and the difference in the energy uh, goes into uh, increasing the uh, temperature. And so um, now, now this here seems a special example. You might think, well, you know, you, you can have combustion without oxygen. You can have another uh, ox oxidant, but um, uh, it's just an example. But uh, mostly in combustion, we look at combustion of hydrocarbon fuels. And so uh, we often take that as an example. Aim of this course is that you develop an understanding of combustion processes uh, from both a physical and a chemical perspective. Um, I said earlier, I assume that you know some fundamentals, and uh, these fundamentals are uh, basic thermodynamics. Um, uh, well, the simple stuff, first law, second law, um, and, and that's almost it, and, and properties. Uh, and then you know some fluid mechanics. Uh, and uh, you know the equations of fluid mechanics, um, uh, the Navier-Stokes equations, and, and perhaps also the equations of, uh, for heat uh, and mass transfer. Um, well, especially the equations, we will not review these in this course. Um, uh, we'll just use them. There's one, uh, you have your lecture notes, and there's one uh, that says lecture three, uh, uh, governing equations or whatever. And so if you think uh, you need to brush up on this, you should uh, take, the you know, take your afternoons, your late afternoons or whatever, and, uh, and look this up. Um, OK, and we'll uh, talk about a few applications. But really, this course is about the theory. And um, you will see that always, uh, or not always, sometimes when you think, oh, now I would like to see a nice application. Uh, we won't talk that much about the applications. Uh, unfortunately, uh, there's not enough time uh, to do that. I, uh, sometimes I teach a course for AAA, uh, which I teach together with uh, Professor Menon from Georgia Tech. And there, uh, I teach one day, and then he teaches the second day. And my course is all about the fundamentals, and this course is all about applications. So, I, I just want to say you can't spend as much time just talking about the applications as about the uh, 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 fundamental theory. Uh, topics here, we'll talk about, I'll give you a, 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 a more detailed overview in a minute, uh, but we'll talk about thermodynamics first and chemical equilibrium, uh, simple, um, well, let's say simple stuff. And then uh, we'll talk about interaction of flow uh, flow means uh, flow and, and of course, also um, uh, molecular transport processes uh, like diffusion and chemistry. And the interaction of flow and chemistry then uh, leads to uh, what we call flames. And um, so here we will talk about laminar and turbulent uh, flames or laminar and turbulent combustion. Uh, about half the course is on, is on 
let's say, thermodynamics and um, uh, laminar flames, um, and then um, half is on turbulent combustion. And while doing that, we'll introduce uh, some new non-dimensional groups. And um, you probably know uh, some of these. Do you know uh, anyone who knows a non-dimensional group? Like the Reynolds number, but that's specific to combustion? Yeah, Zelovich number, Lamkula number, uh, Karlovich number, and so on. I, I feel like uh, yeah, you guys know all this stuff already. Um, and what's interesting, I think always, and uh, my, the students in my uh, uh, combustion course in Aachen, I don't think they appreciate that that much. But um, uh, in this course also, you should learn some, or you know, at least see some uh, uh, use of some mathematical tools like stability analysis, uh, linear stability analysis, uh, asymptotic analysis, and so on, which, which are tools that are um, very, very helpful uh, in research. So, uh, combustion applications, uh, there are some examples here. Um, uh, for example, jet flame, that would be a prototypical uh, combustion configuration, uh, and that would be, let's say, a cigarette lighter, or you could say uh, a candle also is, you know, kind of a jet flame. Um, I usually bring a cigarette lighter or, or a, a burner, and I forgot to get one, but I'll, I'll bring one. Uh, there are some uh, very interesting uh, things you can uh, learn from uh, just looking at a, a cigarette lighter, and, and maybe we'll talk about this more when we talk about flames. Um, other uh, example here is just a spark ignition engine. Uh, spark ignition engine typically is pre-mixed new, um, uh, uh, so, so that brings me to the distinction between pre-mixed and non-pre-mixed, and we'll make that uh, distinction while we go on. The, uh, what's important to realize, even in the beginning, is that the physics for pre-mixed and non-pre-mixed combustion are very, very different. Uh, and then the next thing, uh, and so one, one, one always has to keep that in mind. And, um, and then the next thing that's important to always uh, realize and remember is that um, in a real technical application, even if we call it premixed or non premixed, very often, you know, there's a mix of both of these. So when we say a spark ignition engine combustion is premixed, then um, uh, that might be right for some, I mean, the older uh, engines, but newer uh, engines like direct injection engines, they are, they are sometimes partially premixed. Uh, and especially when you take the example of an aircraft engine, uh, which we call non-premixed, and in our past research we have shown that actually uh, it's not all that non-premixed. There's a lot of real premixed combustion going on, even though you eject liquid fuel, uh, you know, in one stream and then air in a, in a different stream, uh, which one would think is, a, is again, a kind of a prototypical uh, non-premixed combustion. Okay. So just... Uh, to uh, show an example, uh, a jet diffusion flame looks like this. You have fuel uh, and air that come from uh, separate nozzles, uh, or you have a nozzle of fuel and then surrounding air. Again, you know, like a cigarette lighter. Um, uh, mixing takes place by uh, molecular and uh, turbulent diffusion. Uh, cigarette lighter, you have only, um, uh, there's no turbulence typically if you don't you know, crank it up too much. Um, but um, this already shows there's an important distinction here because molecular and turbulent uh, diffusion of molecular and turbulent transport. And um, uh, very often we say that turbulent transport is much, much faster than molecular transport. And so then the question is, is molecular transport important for combustion? Yes or no? Yes. yes, why is it important? Because turbulent transport doesn't bring the molecules together. Turbulent transport just steers things around and it, it increases the gradients. But if I have um, fuel here and air here on the other side, turbulent transport will you know, mix this, but not at a molecular scale. It will just, you know, um, uh, is like, uh, is like if you have a, uh, sometimes you have a dye, you put it in water and you stir it around, you just see spirals um, uh, forming, and, uh, but that's not molecular mixing. So you need molecular mixing to, um, 
uh, bring the molecules together because if you don't have the fuel and the oxygen really a molecule next to each other, mixed with each other, then uh, they can't uh, uh, react with each other, the chemical reaction. So typically, in most applications, we're considering diffusion. Uh, diffusive transport is slower than the chemistry. And um, because of that, uh, the um, combustion usually is mixing controlled, or the diffusion rate of diffusion is uh, the rate determining step. And that, I say, this is very often the case. Why is this the case? Um, this is by design. If you're a combustion engineer, then uh, if you, if you um, design a device where the mixing time is long compared to the, is, uh, it, where the chemistry is long compared to mixing, then um, that flame might not burn, okay? So I give you an example again. I have, I forgot my cigarette lighter. Now I have my cigarette lighter. You can all imagine here my thumb, that's the flame. Um, I have the cigarette lighter, and um, that is now diffusion controlled. The diffusion between the fuel and the surrounding air is very slow, and then once they mix, you know, they kind of burn. Now I want to increase the mixing rate. How do I do this? I blow. So if I blow now at the candle, very slowly at the, the cigarette light, very slowly the mixing rate will increase and you might see that it becomes, you know, turbulent or whatever and um, that uh, you, the soda all goes away, the orange all goes away, you get um, a, a nice blue flame and it becomes shorter and all that. You blow a little harder um, to the point where now mixing is fast compared to the chemistry. Then mixing, uh, fuel and air mix together so quickly that they cool down the flame and um, uh, below a point where extinction occurs, and then it doesn't burn anymore. So in a gas turbine, of course, you don't want that. Uh, you always want the flame to burn. And therefore, by design, typically um, uh, combustion uh, devices are, are designed such that, uh, well, they burn. And, and because of that, uh, or uh, uh, they're, they're, they're mixing uh, limited and not chemistry. So this is just an example, excuse the, the German here. I didn't see there was a, um, didn't realize there was a German here. This is just an example of a, a flame or experiments here in the flame. You see this here is the, just the, the luminosity of the flame, it's just a photo. And then here you see the fuel concentration and OH and, and temperature here and NOx. And what's interesting to see here, there are different uh, scales uh, different things happen in, in different um, uh, scales. You see the fuel uh, here, there's a potential core close to the nozzle and then it mixes with the air and slowly fuel goes away. And uh, you see here, let's say at this point, you know, the fuel, let's say, is pretty much mixed out, let's say, when the, uh, when the uh, yellow here disappears. And then uh, you see the temperature appears, the high temperature here, appears within this mixing region and the uh, jet here actually is cold on the center line. Okay? What does that mean? If you have a jet like this or you have a, um, you have a, a cigarette lighter, okay, uh, on the center line the temperature is cold. Okay? Try it out. If you stick your finger inside, it will <laughs> not burn the tip of your finger. <laughs> So uh, that's a little experiment that you can do uh, later today. Uh, get some uh, cold water ready. But then what's interesting is you see there's a thermal thickness of this, of this layer. And now look at OH. OH, the thickness of this radical layer, is much, much thinner. Okay? So the concept of thin flames, uh, that, that will come uh, back later on. And then you see also Nox here uh, is, um, uh, you know, appears more on the order of the thermal layer than the radical layer. Okay, um, so this was an example for non premix combustion. An example for premix combustion, I said this earlier here, spark ignition engine. Um, uh, in a spark ignition engine, uh, you, let's say, typically you fill the combustion chamber with a mixture of fuel and air, everything pre-mixed. Then this mixture is compressed up to a certain point, 
And then uh, once you want to burn, uh, you introduce a spark. And so the spark uh, plug is, is here. What you see here, so this is, um, this is um, a picture here that goes through uh, the piston. This is a transparent piston. And then you see this, these here are the valves, uh, the uh, intake and exhaust valve. The exhaust valve typically uh, a, a little uh, larger. And then here you have the, um, the spark plug. And you see that there's a, uh, there's a turbulent flow in here. And there's a flame that propagates now away from the spark plug. And here it's larger. And then here it's uh, yet larger. And you see the turbulence uh, here playing with this flame. But again, you see a thin interface. Um, between the unburned and the burnt uh, mixture here again. And um, here, this seems to be even thinner. Um, what else is interesting here? I think that's it. This is a laminar flame. This is a, a combustion vessel that's sparked in the center, and that is used to measure laminar burning velocities. And again, uh, you, see, you see here the very, very thin interface between burnt and unburnt, which uh, becomes thinner even at high pressure. And most applications that, we, that we're interested in combustion are uh, at high pressure. So uh, another example here, gas turbine. Uh, again, I said earlier, typical example for non-premix. This is a, a Rolls-Royce um, gas turbine. Uh, try to find the combustor. There's a pan here. And then this is the bypass the core, uh, compressor, low pressure compressor, and here high pressure compressor, and then this here is the combustor. So here fuel is injected, combustion happens, and then this here is the high pressure turbine, uh, two stages, and then a few stages here, low pressure turbine, and that's it. And of course, the, uh, the turbine drives the shaft, which drives the compressor, and also drives the fan, which accelerates the bypass air. So um, uh, the, you see the combustor is a very small part, but of course that's where all the energy needs to be converted from. Um, uh, uh, needs to be converted from the uh, uh, the chemical energy into uh, thermal energy. So this here shows um, from the experiments temperature uh, and also from simulation. Uh, this lower part here is the simulation. The upper part is the No, this is, this is the uh, experiment, and all these three are uh, simulations. It's NOx here, temperature, and uh, this is also temperature. And this is a cross-section. And what's interesting here is uh, it kind of shows you where the questions are. What are the questions? So that's an, an important point again. When we talk about combustion theory, um, um, we need to always keep in mind, what is the question that with combustion science we want to answer at the end? One uh, simple uh, question is, of course, this thing only flies because there's a heat release. And, um, uh, but that heat release, um, which leads to an acceleration of the fluid, uh, but that heat release is, um, uh, that's, that's relatively simple to describe. You don't need all the stuff I'm going to tell you here uh, in order to just describe the heat release. What's more important now uh, these days is, um, uh, you know, with all the CO2 uh, discussion is efficiency. And uh, I, I'll show you how efficiency uh, depends on, you know, what you see here. And, um, and then also emissions. Uh, for example, NOx uh, or soot uh, are emissions. And they're very, very hard to uh, compute uh, with good accuracy. And uh, so, um, so that's usually what we try to answer. Who can tell me? You know, how what you see is related to efficiency. Anyone knows what I'm talking about? What you're saying is very, very relevant, uh, especially for internal combustion engines also. Uh, here was thinking of something a little different. Yeah, the maximum temperature. So what you see here is that in the experiment, you see that the temperature is not homogeneous. You get one peak uh, temperature point, And that's bad. Because why is it bad? You might remember that 
the efficiency of a gas turbine, the rate and cycle, just thermodynamic efficiency, it depends on the temperature at the exit of the combustor. Okay? Or you could say also it depends on the pressure ratio, but the pressure ratio and the certain heat release translated to a maximum temperature at the uh, combustor exit. Now, if you make the, the temperature of the combustor exit higher, you get a better efficiency. So why don't you make it higher? Because it will burn off the turbine. Okay. So what you see here then, uh, what you see here then, is you have a primary combustion region, and then you have the secondary air supposed to cool this down and produce a very homogeneous mixture. Because um, if you have a very homogeneous mixture, that means you can max out the, the uh, compression ratio or, or the, um, the temperature at that point. But you see that mixing here is not all that efficient. It leaves behind uh, this hot spot here, which means that the mean temperature now has to be lower because you don't want this hot spot to burn the turbine. Okay? So the temperature distribution at the combustor exit, it sounds trivial, but that's another thing that's very hard um, uh, to compute and uh, also is, is very, very important. And that leads to the notion of the so-called pattern factor, and the pattern factor is the ratio between the highest uh, temperature you find here, the peak temperature, and the average temperature. This pattern factor is very important in the design of, of these gas. Okay, good. So this, just as an introduction, some examples. We, we will go back now uh, to square one and start with very simple stuff. And um, I see here most of you, or many of you here, at least, uh, you know, have some uh, knowledge in combustion. So we try to go fast through this. Um, I have the tendency always, to, I get excited about this stuff, and I talk a lot more than I want. And, um, uh, and so I'm usually a little behind, so I try to make maybe, um, uh, you know, uh, be a little fast at the beginning, and then uh, maybe if I try to be really fast, then I come out just right. But, but if, I, if we manage to, you know, gain some time, that leaves us a lot more time for later on when we talk about turbulent combustion, where things also might be a little more uh, complicated or, or, or more new for everyone here. So uh, this course here was taught, uh, combustion theory, last year by Professor Matalon. Um, and two years ago, was uh, taught by Professor Norbert Peters. And uh, uh, Peters, he used to be the director of the uh, Institute for Combustion Technology in, in Aachen. Uh, and so he retired two years ago, and now I'm uh, his successor. And so um, we work together very closely. I got my PhD also from uh, Professor Peters. And um, so we work together very closely. He actually has um, these lecture notes that um, uh, he distributed here two years ago. And I decided uh, to um, basically go along his course. I made some uh, changes. <coughs> But um, basically, we'll follow his course and uh, to have some consistency. And so this thing here, I think these lecture notes, I think they have not been distributed, but they are on the CEFRC website, and, and you can download these as a PDF file. So they have a lot of information uh, on, the, uh, on the details. Also, the, um, you know, the slides I'm using here, I, again, I updated these uh, here and there. but. Um, uh, they basically follow uh, uh, Professor Peter's uh, course that he gave two years ago. So uh, this is the overview of, of what we are going to talk about. This says is a 15 lecture course. You will see here that some of these lectures are very, very short. They have only three slides or whatever. Uh, and, and others are very long. And so uh, when we say 15 lecture course, it will not be one to one. Uh, you know, we'll just We'll just keep going, and hopefully at the end of the day, uh, we'll have finished the whole thing. Um, so I, I um, you put these in different sections here a little bit. Um, we will start talking about thermodynamics and mass balances of combustion systems. Uh, that's what we'll do today. Uh, we'll talk about flame temperature, adiabatic flame temperature, and uh, chemical equilibrium. Uh, and we'll do this fast. Typically, then, in this course, um, there is a, um, oh, and then I, um, I forgot, uh, there is a, a part here, fluid dynamics and balance equation for reacting flows. 
And I mentioned before, we're not going to uh, talk about this part, but you have it in your lecture notes. And if you think you want to see how the equations are derived and all that, or how the energy equation, I mean, the only thing that's really a little more tricky uh, is the energy equation. Uh, you can write it, you can, you derive it. How's the energy equation derived? I mean, the three-dimensional energy equation that we use in, in CFD solvers derived from the first law of thermodynamics. That's it, it's very simple. Uh, but then you can write it in a thousand different forms. You can write it in temperature form, uh, internal energy, um, uh, enthalpy, and so on. And, you know, to convert one. And then there are different, then there are different um, enthalpies. You know, there's the sensible enthalpy, and there's the, the you know, the, the total enthalpy, and so on. And so you can write the temperature, the energy equation, all these different forms. That's the only thing, I mean, if you're really interested. I don't think it make, will make a big difference here for our course. But um, if you're ever interested, uh, this, uh, these notes have some, uh, give you some ideas. So then typically here, there's a section on, I mean, in my combustion course, there's a section on uh, kinetics and um, on uh, homogeneous systems, auto ignition analysis for auto ignition processes and so on. And um, we decided to take this out here because there is a course on combustion kinetics uh, that's taught uh, by Professor Wang. And, um, um, uh, and then also, uh, in the interest of time, to put a little more emphasis here on, on flame. So then a uh, section of, of uh, lecture four to seven um, is on premix combustion. So there is a, a section 11 of premix configurations, thermal flame theory, uh, and then asymptotic structure of uh, methane air flames, and then uh, flame extinction and flammability limits. So this all refers to uh, premix combustion. Then there is um, a, sh a shorter section. You'll see there's in this course there's a lot more emphasis on premix combustion than on non-premix. Uh, that's not because premix is technically more relevant. It's just because it's more complicated. Um, there is um, uh, there are two sections here. Then on uh, diffusion flames or non-premix flames. And then um, there's a section here on, let's say, turbulence and turbulence theory um, for those you know who are lacking the background uh, in this area. And then also we'll talk here about uh, briefly about uh, different uh, combustion modeling approaches. And then uh, 11 to 13 here, we talk about premix turbulent combustion, uh, and also introduce here the level set approach as one uh, possible model to model uh, turbulence. Uh, previous combustion, then uh, briefly here again on non previous combustion, and then there is a section here on uh, applications. This, because I um, uh, took this from Peters, has a lot of his application, maybe, uh, and you have this in your notes, uh, uh, especially uh, with an emphasis here on internal combustion engines. That's very fitting because there's also a course here on uh, internal combustion engines this week. Uh, maybe. Um, uh, I'll show you some uh, uh, applications about other fields uh, also, uh, uh, maybe on uh, gas turbines or something. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, very good. So we'll um, start then here with the section on thermodynamics and mass balances. Um, and so uh, this statement here is interesting. Uh, because it does not just refer to um, uh, to combustion, it refers to uh, the world, life, and everything else. Uh, the final state of a, of a system, uh, of any system, is not just a, well, let's say, a homogeneous system, is uh, governed by the classical balance laws of thermodynamics, uh, or let's say, uh, chemical equilibrium. Um, uh, and chemical equilibrium really uh, means you know, it's governed by the second law of thermodynamics. If you leave this room, uh, if you leave it here for uh, uh, quadrillion years or whatever, what's the largest number you know, then uh, it will all be mixed out with the surroundings and uh, it will have achieved a state very close to um, equilibrium. Okay? You know the whole universe uh, will um, reach a state of equilibrium, everything the same everywhere. And um, 
and you will be a big part of that. Um, so, um, we, so, but but also for uh, for chemistry, this so chemistry. So why does this not go faster? I mean, I have a wood floor here, okay, and I have oxygen in the air, okay. That's the so why doesn't it not just go bam and um, uh, is all CO two and H two O? Because because of what? Because of uh, kinetics. It's kinetically limited, okay. Thermodynamics really says, hey, I really want this wood and the air. I want them to react and form something, you know, that's a lot more stable. And it tries to do it all the time. It's actually working on it right now as we speak, okay? But kinetics, chemical kinetics makes this very slow because the temperature here is very low. If I locally increase the temperature a little bit, uh, well, you know how much, you know, roughly, okay? then it will start doing its thing, and it will go to equilibrium. Okay. So the higher the temperature, uh, the faster the kinetics are, and um, the kinetics, uh, when the kinetics are fast, then things like to go to equilibrium um, very fast. You, depending on, yeah, the, if the kinetics are fast, then uh, equilibrium is reached very quickly. So um, we have to, in combustion, we have to always uh, distinguish between the uh, thermodynamic equilibrium, or, or, or what thermodynamic, thermodynamics really wants to do, and kinetics. What does the kinetics allow? Okay? So kinetics makes things fast or slow. And thermodynamics just determines what the final point is, what, what is the attractor of the system. Okay? And this, the system will always try to move towards that attractor that's given by thermodynamics, and kinetics tells you how fast it's going. Okay? So in combustion, temperatures, we make the temperature because of the heat release, the temperatures are usually very high, and because of that, um, we, we typically get to a, a state that is actually quite close to chemical equilibrium, even if it's not exactly chemical equilibrium. Okay, so in order to determine what the chemical equilibrium is, uh, we need to understand first what are concentrations, what are thermodynamic variables, and uh, what are the mass and energy balances for multi-component uh, systems, and that's what we're going to do right now. So all this is uh, known here to you. There are mole fractions and mass fractions. Um, the difference between the two, uh, of course, or the main difference that's of interest to us is that uh, you can express a multi-component mixture in terms of mass fractions or mole fractions, but uh, what's nice about mass is mass is conserved. Uh, it doesn't depend on the chemical reactions, but uh, the number of moles is not conserved, of course. Okay? So very often we try to stick with mass uh, because it makes the balancing a lot easier. Uh, mole fraction, you know what a mole is. Um, uh, you know, you have uh, the mole, number of mole of a certain species, here we call it an I. You sum these all, all up, you get the total number of moles. And uh, uh, with moles, we just count. It's just a counter. I mean, that's why mole is real kindergarten stuff, because it's just counting, counting things. And, um, um, and then the, the, there's a mole fraction, of course. Uh, and if you sum up all mole fractions, they sum up to one. Uh, the mass fraction. Uh, can be converted here from the mole fraction using the molecular weight. Um, well, if you sum up all the masses of the individual components, the, the, then you get the total mass. You can introduce a mass fraction, which is the mass of a certain component I over the total mass um, from the mole fractions or the mass fractions and the molecular weights. We can compute the molecular weight of the mixture, uh, which is given here like this. And then also, uh, having that uh, molecular weight of the mixture, we can convert mole fraction into mass fraction. Okay? So that's all. Um, so I say it's all simple stuff, and probably most of you agree. But, but for some of you, you might not have heard this. And if we go a little fast now, then you go back later on and look at this. Because this is very important. Um, then there's another thing that's not so common, maybe. Uh, that's the mass fraction of elements. So now if I have a mixture, 
of, let's say, methane and, and air, so I have methane, N2, and O2, then I can look at the uh, mass fraction of methane, O2, and N2, but I can also look at the mass fraction of the individual elements. Uh, and that, again, is, is something that um, uh, you'll understand in a second is, is sometimes very, very helpful. Uh, so the mass fraction of the elements would be the mass fraction of uh, carbon and the mass fraction of hydrogen and the mass fraction of uh, oxygen and mass fraction of nitrogen, okay? Um, why is this helpful? Because, again, the total mass is conserved, okay? But the mass of the individual components is not conserved. The mass of methane is not conserved. When it burns, the methane is gone. You will have converted that mass, the, met the methane mass, to somehow the reaction products, um, but that, that methane mass, MI or M methane is consumed. However, the mass of the elements is still conserved, okay? So the methane has a certain mass of carbon and that mass of carbon is not going away. It will be just be converted into a different molecule. So that's why um, these element mass fractions are sometimes useful because they are a conserved uh, quantity that doesn't change with chemical reactions. Um, okay, so this is how you uh, can look at this. Mj here, that would be the mass of atom J. Okay, and you can compute this from the, from the mass of uh, individual species. So this is the mass of individual species of a species I. Divide this by the molecular weight. Uh, then this would be the number of molecules of species I. Now you have a matrix here, AIJ, and that's the main point here. The matrix A tells you how many, how many atoms of J you have in species I, okay? So if I have the number here of, let's say, the methane molecules now, times this matrix here uh, for hydrogen, it will now tell you now we have four hydrogens. So this says I had one methane times AIJ means I have four hydrogen, and then times the molecular weight or the atomistic weight, uh, atomic weight of hydrogen here gives you the mass of hydrogen. Okay. So that, uh, but it's just a formula, and the main thing here is this matrix. So from this also we can define these mass fractions of the elements, and um, you know. The you can just compute these from this. Uh, here from the mass fractions or the mole fractions. And then it's important here um, that mole fractions, because they're always, uh, they're always um, related to the total number of moles, uh, they sum up to one. So if you sum up the mole fractions of each, of all species, sum to one, mass fractions sum to one, and all the mass fractions, the element mass fractions always sum up. Uh, so if uh, you guys have questions, uh, just uh, interrupt or raise your hand. It's even better than uh, just interrupting. Um, so mass fraction, mole fraction. Then we have another thing here. We call this typically the concentration, or you could call it the partial molar density. And that is the uh, mole, the, 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 the partial mole number of species I divided by the volume. And that quantity uh, that we call this the concentration uh, and um, that is important because um, reaction rates are typically uh, proportional to the concentration of the individual species that participate in the reaction. That's why this uh, concentration is very important. Okay, so there's a total concentration here also. The concentration, if you sum it up of all species, not one, it gives you the total concentration total number of moles per volume. And, um, and there's the density, and I don't need to introduce the density here. Uh, important is the density is related here to the uh, mass fraction. And then you can, you having the density, uh, there's a conversion here of the concentration uh, into the mass fraction or vice versa. And so the mass fraction of species I times density over molecular weight of species I, that gives us concentration. So that's a very useful uh, relationship. 
OK, so you see here, we go bam, 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 one by one, you know, one thing after the other. And, um, uh, but it goes on for only, uh, only five more minutes or whatever. Um, the thermal equation of state. Um, so we have talked now about um, there was a volume here. There was, a, there was a, a pressure here. So we come to the thermodynamic um, uh, state uh, uh, variables. And um, so these are just two. Temperature, of course, uh, we talked about temperature uh, is another one. And there's the thermal equation of state, uh, which relates um, uh, the uh, pressure, the, um, let's say, the density or here the mole number, and the uh, temperature. And so uh, you all know this uh, equation of state. Uh, interesting here is that uh, this here is, of course, only for ideal gases. And it's important to mention that um, typically, uh, when we talk about combustion processes, um, the ideal gas assumption is a really, really good assumption. Even if you have liquid fuels, once they evaporate, uh, they're typically immediately in a state uh, that is very well described with the uh, ideal gas equation or by the ideal gas assumption, uh, which only breaks down when you go to very, very high pressure. But uh, typically, you don't reach these high pressures in normal combustion systems. Uh, the only, the only, I should say the only system, but one system where you do need to consider um, a real gas equation is what? Rockets. Rockets. Uh, uh, in rockets, very often, you have supercritical uh, states. and um, they are super critical, but not far enough, uh, far away, uh, um, uh, enough uh, removed from the critical state, uh, so that uh, real gas effects are really important. Okay, so these are just different ways uh, to write this for a uh, single gas. So this here is um, written for a single component, and uh, it's also written using the. Uh, universal gas pump, which is what we typically do in, in, uh, for combustion process. So there's Dalton's law. Dalton's law says uh, essentially that if you have a mixture of ideal gases, then each, each, each component uh, behaves as if it was just alone. Okay? It takes up the full volume and it obeys individually the equation of state uh, as it is written here, as it is written here. So each component uh, obeys uh, this equation of state. Or you can say uh, each, if you have in a certain volume, at a certain temperature, a certain number of moles of a species, then that species exerts a pressure, PI, on its surroundings. And if you have many components, then these pressures, and that's what Dalton's law says, these pressures, they just add up to the, um, uh, uh, to the full thermodynamic pressure. And the reason, of course, is that um, for ideal gases, we assume that individual molecules are so far apart from each other that they never see each other. And um, of course, then one gas doesn't care about uh, the presence of another gas. Um, Interesting here is that um, you can show from this that the mole fraction is equal to pi, the partial pressure over the total pressure. Okay, so that's uh, for ideal gases. That's important. And then also you can show that the mole fraction is equal to the partial volume over the total volume. Okay, so the mole fraction. Is the is the you know is related to the is directly related to partial pressures and the um, and also the volumes. These are two uh, useful relationships again. Okay, any questions about this? This was just thermodynamics fundamentals for multi-component systems. No. So uh, stoichiometry. Um, we won't talk too much about um, chemical kinetics. We will talk, though, about uh, some very important reactions. Uh, we'll get to that. 
uh, when we talk about the um, uh, what's called the four-step mechanism for methane, uh, is important to uh, look at some of the uh, chemical kinetics. Al also, although we tried to uh, keep chemical kinetics as much out of this course as possible. Now, uh, we typically write a qu um, uh, chemical reactions like this, H2 plus 1 half O2 gives H2O. Uh, we have these um, uh, stoichiometric coefficients here, 0 0.5 for O2, 1 for H2, and um, or we write it like this, H plus O2 goes to OH plus O. Uh, the difference between these two is this second one here is an elementary reaction. Uh, the first one here is a global, a so-called global reaction. What's the difference between elementary and global reaction? Elementary reactions, they happen like this. They happen because the, 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 um, uh, the educts, uh, so the um, uh, uh, H here and the O2, they really, uh, physically, they come together and they form an activated complex and then they fall apart again and they fall apart into OH and O. So this is something that, as it is written here, uh, typically it happens. And so we write this with this kind of double arrow and this happens, it goes forward and reverse, at the forward and reverse, they are connected uh, with the, the laws of thermodynamics and so on. A global reaction is a reaction that does not happen this way. Um, this reaction, well, even if you take it, you know, times two, I mean, of course you see it with half an O2, that, uh, that doesn't make sense. But even if we would say 2H2 plus O2 goes to 2H2O, this is something that does not happen that way. Um, uh, you don't have two hydrogen molecules you're coming together with an oxygen molecule and then, you know, uh, falling apart into two uh, water. Uh, this is a consequence of many, 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 or few, uh, individual elementary reactions, okay? So you see, we, here in this class, we often use global reactions. And uh, you see we write the global reaction with an equal sign where the elementary reaction is right like this, just so you uh, can distinguish what is uh, what's a global and what's an elementary reaction. Yeah, so, and this is just now nomenclature. We have the stoichiometric coefficient here of the reactants and the products. The reactants have a, a prime here. The products have a prime prime. If I do this, I can write a chemical reaction in a general form like this, where M here is just a symbol for a uh, for a species, that might be H or O2 or whatever. So M is just a is just a symbol, and then uh, this reaction that we had on the previous page. Maybe for most species, the new here would be zero, but for hydrogen it would be one, and for O2 it would be uh, 0.5. Okay, so that's how we can write this in general form. And then we just need these matrices or these vectors here, and that describe the full reaction system. Um, then we can say the, the net stoichiometric coefficient is the product minus the um, reactant and um, that is then positive for product and negative for reactants. And then I, I can, uh, 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 so I have one of these here for each species for each uh, reaction and then I can introduce a matrix here. So this is supposed to be a new here, not a, not a V. Uh, this, this uh, new here for each reaction. So then I can, if I have this matrix here, U I L, where U I L stoichiometric coefficient of species I in reaction L, and again this is negative for uh, reactants, positive for products, and then I can write a chemical reaction system in this very simple form. Okay. Again, this is just nomenclature uh, to make um, uh, to make for a simpler. Uh, way to uh, write a reaction system. Okay. So standing here and talking for like uh, five hours um, is not good for your voice. And um, I, I mentioned earlier I teach this AAA course and it's uh, eight hours a day actually. But it's only one day, but it's full eight hours. 
And, and after teaching that, my voice usually gone. And so I, the, this was the first time I, I, I taught it. Voice was taught. Second time I taught it, I had water there and it was drinking all day. And everything was fine. So yesterday I asked them, are we going to have water here this morning? They said, yes, water will be there. But there's no water. <laughs> anyway, so maybe I'll turn up the volume a little bit. And um, then I don't speak that loud. And that also helps me conserve my voice. And then I get water for the afternoon, and then I can start yelling at you again. So is this good? Can I speak like this? It's good in the back, or it's not loud enough. Is it good? Good. I'd rather speak loud, actually. Anyways, I wanted to just break here for one second because I want to tell you the thing I'm going to say now is very important. Okay? So I want to give you one minute to get everything together again and then uh, look at this. What we're going to talk about now is uh, so-called coupling functions. Coupling functions, that is you know, one of the most important things in combustion because combustion is you know, seemingly complicated because you have so many species, so many reactions and all of that. And coupling functions make things a lot easier, make your life a lot easier. Because it turns out, um, well, as the name suggests, they couple certain things together. And it's relatively easy to understand. It's relatively easy to understand. So if I have a reaction like this, CH4 plus 2O2 goes to uh, CO2 plus 2H2O. That is wrong now, okay, because it's non elementary reaction. So I should write it there. Okay? So if I have a reaction like this, then it's a global reaction. What does it say? I have a combustion system. Let's say I have a box and I fill it with the fuel and uh, O2. Let's say I do it even in these proportions. Okay? Then what this, what this reaction tells you is any time you consume one CH4, you consume two O2. Okay? So if I tell you, if I do a measurement and I tell you I consumed four CH4. Then everyone here can tell me how much of two I consumed. Right? How much? How many? Yeah. What did you do in your mind before you said eight? You said, oh, I have a delta N, okay? A DN. That was eight. Okay? And then you said, so how often did that reaction actually happen? So you divided the eight by the stoichiometric coefficient here of methane, which is one. Okay? So I said eight, so it happened eight times. Eight times this reaction was executed. Okay? And you said, so for each reaction, how often, uh, for each reaction, uh, how many O2? Two. two. And so you do just uh, four, four times two is eight, okay? So, and this is what this is. So let's say one here, index one refers to the fuel. Then you said, take dn, delta n, divided by the stoichiometric coefficient of the fuel. I made a mistake here, I should have said, I should have said two here to make it, you know, and four. Okay. And now I say, now I say uh, eight, and you say sixteen or whatever. Okay, so you divide this by the stoichiometric, the delta n here. You divide this by the stoichiometric coefficient of, of methane, and you multiply to the stoichiometric coefficient of, of oxygen, and it gives you this. So basically, the dn i by nu i 
that tells you how often was the reaction executed. Okay? So the D, that means the DNI over the UI, that's the same for each species. Okay? It couples the consumption and production of all species together. Okay? And that's what we call, well, that's a relation that allows us then to compute these coupling functions. So this is now uh, directly from this global reaction. I can write this here in terms of the masses by just dividing this by the molecular weight. And I can also write it in terms of the mass fraction by just by dividing this by the total density. So. Okay? So that relation now um, can be integrated. We give it a couple, coupling function, and we do that later on. But that um, function again, we say that again because it's really important. That function now, um, that if I tell you just how one species changes, you can tell me all the others. And we'll see later on that also can be coupled with the temperature. Because the temperature, you know, if I consume one methane, I raise the temperature by a little bit. Okay? I have a certain heat release that's associated with that. Okay? And so we'll see later on, uh, you know, how this all comes together. But it's all based on coupling if you uh, ever heard about uh, mixture fraction, for example, that's a coupling function. Okay? In premixed combustion, uh, these coupling functions, they're used to say, um, uh, or, or let's say, a chemical system usually depends on the concentration of, a, of the fuel, of oxygen, and the temperature. But if they're all coupled with these coupling functions, then I can re reduce this to just one unknown. Okay? And that's how we often use Okay, so stoichiometry. What is stoichiometric? And I guess everyone knows this. Stoichiometric is if the fuel to oxygen ratio is such that both are entirely consumed when converted to CO2 and H2O. Uh, now, here, this again is a, a special formulation, let's say, for hydrocarbon combustion. Um, but um, uh, so this is uh, this here would be uh, stoichiometric. Uh, you see this here, if the fuel just goes to these uh, products, the main reaction products. Uh, and that's what we call these here the stoichiometric coefficients, because what we, what we have then in the global reaction gives us the, um, the, the relation between the individual uh, reactants so that they are uh, in stoichiometric proportions. So for example, this here can be written in a more general form like this, CMHN, that you know, just has all hydrocarbons if you want. Um, and so you see uh, that, uh, let's say we choose, so nu f, one of these can be chosen uh, arbitrarily, it's choose nu f equal to one. And then you see uh, nu uh, CO2 here is of course the same as the, uh, the index here because if I have a, a C2H4, then I get two, two CO2 and so on. So you know, just from knowing that you want carbon to go to CO2 and you want H to go to H2O, uh, once you fix the stoichiometric coefficient here, uh, the coefficient for the for the fuel, then all the others are given like this. Okay. So um, the stoichiometric coefficient. So these are the coefficients now from this uh, from this global reaction. And of course, I can relate these directly to the uh, mole numbers because um, uh, as long as the moles are in that relation, that uh, would be a stoichiometric mixture. Or you can also do it, uh, write this in terms of the, um, of the mass fraction. And so the mass fraction, so the stoichiometric um, uh, mass fraction uh, relation, uh, ratio here of O2 and Q, you can convert that back to the uh, mole fractions. You can write the mole fractions as stoichiometric coefficients. And then uh, you see that in addition, uh, these um, uh, molecular weights appear. And so this here is a ratio that very often appears, and we call this nu. 
Okay. Uh, it's just uh, an abbreviation because this um, uh, thing appears often. Just wondering when when we're supposed to have a break. Uh, ten fifteen. Ten fifteen. Yeah. Yes. Yes, the question is, what if the fuel contains other uh, uh, atoms like nitrogen? Then uh, we, have to, we have to say, you have to say what you consider complete combustion, okay? So going back to this, that's what I said, this is maybe not so good. We should say um, the fuel is such that both are entirely consumed when complete combustion occurs, okay? And then we have to say, what is complete combustion? Here we say complete combustion of hydrocarbons, CO2, and, and H2O. Thank you very much. Now, if you have nitrogen, you can say, let's say you had, a, you had something that has an N here at the end, okay? Then uh, you could say, well, that N, I want this to be N2 at the end. Okay, I call this uh, complete combustion, okay? Or, uh, and that's what we have. Yeah, typically, we have plus, um, you know, 4 times 79 over 21 times N2. And then here we get the same, uh, we just call this alpha uh, N2. Okay? That's what we call complete combustion. We want the N2 to be conserved. Okay? You could also say, I want this to be NO2 uh, or uh, whatever you want. But you define it. And once you have this, then you can, you know, have your stoichiometric coefficient. Okay? And of course, if you have oxygen here, if you have oxygen here, it's not very hard, right? The same machine applies. Okay? Okay? Um, let's see. So new, this is a new here. It's called stoichiometric mass. Okay, coming back to this coupling function I uh, promised earlier, we're going to integrate this. And so if I integrate uh, this relation here, uh, the, the index one here refers to the fuel, it could be anything else, but let's say it's the fuel. And now let's take I to be the oxygen. Then I have uh, this is oxygen, this fuel, and I can integrate it from unburned to some state between, you know, unburned and fully burned. And then you see I get YO2 minus YO2 unburned. And here I get YF minus YF unburned. And then you see if I uh, bring this here to the right hand side, then I have exactly this ratio here UO2, WO2, and so on. Uh, again, we call this U. And um, it's here. And then this is what we get. And now this is really, you know, what we call the coupling function because again it tells you so so these are given okay these are your initial conditions unburned conditions this is what you mix together and let's say I tell you how the fuel evolves then you can tell me immediately from this relation how the oxygen evolves okay or let's say you have a you have a reaction rate and it depends on fuel and oxygen you can eliminate one of the two with this coupling function okay so that, uh, these coupling functions are very, very powerful. Um, right, so for stoichiometric mixture, at the end of the day, fuel and oxygen are completely consumed. And so YF and, and YO2 uh, at the end are zero. And that, again, shows um, that same relation here. Uh, so this is for stoichiometric conditions, zero. Uh, you know, at fully burned conditions, zero. And then you see here that the uh, uh, YO2 over Y fuel is just equal to this stoichiometric mass ratio. Okay. The same thing we had earlier. Now, I mentioned, oh, now I can take it. Okay. Oh, this is the original Princeton water. 
Um, so I mentioned one special coupling function is the mixture fraction. And the mixture fraction is, um, again, this is a very, very important uh, concept in combustion uh, for premix, uh, non premix combustion in particular. And um, is, is very powerful, very useful. Um, it's not too hard to understand it either, uh, but it's very important uh, that you do understand. Okay, so we take our time uh, looking at this. So this says here is for homogeneous system, but you would see later on it's very uh, simple to uh, extend that to whatever you like. So let me start out and look at a system that looks like this. I have two streams that I use to fill this box, okay? And the mixture fraction, so I call this stream one and the other stream two. And so now the mixture fraction is defined like this. It's just the mass that, that, I, that I brought through this stream one divided by total mass at one plus M2, okay? So that's, that's uh, simple. Now what we typically do is we associate one with the fuel stream and the other with the air stream. But again, the mass, the mixture fraction, M1, that's not fuel, that's not a fuel mass. It's just the mass that comes through this port one. Mixture fraction in that sense is nothing else, has nothing to do with fuel and air, let's say. It's just how we use it at the end of the day. The mixture fraction just tells you, you have two streams, okay? And it tells you the mass ratio from, of stream number one. That's it, okay? That stream, could be a fuel stream. And it could be a stream fuel mixed with air. Okay? It could be partially premixed, could be whatever. You just say I call this stream one, this stream two, and then this what it is. Okay? So uh, as I said, um, both both streams, so this says fuel and oxidizer stream. I, I don't think this is how we should look at it. Both streams could have fuel, oxidizer, and Nitrogen. Okay? But now we want to go back and say this is a general case, and now we want to look at this more in terms of um, you know how does this help us for combustion. And so we want to introduce um, the fuel somehow. And we want to say um, we have in the Stream one, I have a certain part of fuel. And um, that fuel, uh, you can have fuel, but you can also have um, nitrogen there, inert. Okay? So we want to say uh, YF1 then would be um, is M fuel, M fuel Uh, in stream one divided by the total of stream one, that would be F, M fuel one uh, plus M uh, inert in stream one, okay? And so then you have um, the uh, mixture fraction. I want to split that up also. I want to say the stream one here, that might have a f a fuel, so stream one here might have fuel and uh, inert, then this would be uh, M fuel one plus M inert one divided now by the total mass, which would be M fuel one plus M inert one plus um, M two, okay? So, uh, so these are just two definitions, and now I can say, uh, so what is now the, um, 
unburned fuel that I have here in this box. Why F unburned uh, after I mixed it? And that is equal to um, M fuel one divided by the total mass I have. F comma one uh, plus M inert comma one plus M. Okay? So and now you see I can write this as M F comma one divided by uh, M F comma one plus M I comma one times M F comma one plus M I comma one and then divided by this total mass M F comma one plus M I comma one plus F two okay and then you see this first part here, that would be YF1, that is the mass fraction of the fuel in stream one. So this is YF1, and you see the second part here is mixer fraction, okay? So what is this? Uh, so you get this relation here, that's what we have. So, so what is this relation? This here would be actually, this would just say, uh, the unburned fuel here is equal to Z, equal to mixer fraction, if stream one was pure fuel and no inerts. Okay. So, um, but again, keep in mind, the mixer fraction is not the mass fraction of fuel, it is just the mass fraction of stream one, okay? So even if you have a stream that has 95% nitrogen and 5% fuel, okay? Mixture fraction in that stream one, mixture fraction in that stream one is still one. Okay, good. So we have this. Now for oxygen, you can write, do the same thing. Okay, you get this. And now you see I have my coupling function. Let's see, where do we have the coupling function? Uh, so we had this and this, and I have the coupling function. And so now I can express these in terms of mixer fraction. Can I introduce these here and uh, solve this for mixer fraction. This is what I get. Forget about the second part here. Let's look at the first part. This is what we get. Okay. And now this thing is a little hard to understand. Okay. If you try to understand mixer fraction just by looking at this, it's very hard. I think. You have YF fuel minus YO2 and so on. That's not the point. Just, ha you know, half this thing, but always remember back. Mixture fraction just tells me how much mass comes from stream one and how much comes from stream two. Well, here we associate one then with the, uh, with the, the, the stream that carries the fuel, okay? Okay, so uh, interesting now also. Uh, for stoichiometric conditions, the uh, YO2 and YF are zero because, because you know, when it burns, uh, stoichiometric conditions, there's no fuel left and no oxygen left. So this is zero, and then Z stoichiometric here is YO2 comma two, I mean, just the second part. Okay, that's, that's Y stoichiometric. Okay? So this gives you the stoichiometric mixer fraction, or tells you what is the stoichiometric value, uh, or the, the value of mixer fraction, where fuel and air are exactly in stoichiometric proportion. Okay? okay, so that's mixer fraction. Uh, this here goes back and shows you again this YO22 and YF1 as function of Z. These are exactly these relations here. You have YF1, that could be less than one, in this case here, I mean, there's no scale here, but let's say there's this one, and it's just linear. Why if, uh, why fuel unburned? It's just linear with the uh, mixer fraction. Why O22, the 
O2, of course, is typically mixed in with nitrogen and uh, is also linear, uh, but at a lower level. Okay? Okay, so now, from this, we, uh, we can try to understand how does the composition look like so when it's stoichiometric, that fuel and air, they just go away, okay, they're zero. But what happens if you're rich or if you're lean, okay? So here, first look at Z small as Z stoichiometric. Because we said Z mixture fraction gives you the mass that comes from the fuel stream. Small values of Z means you're lean, okay? So Z small and then stoichiometric means the the mixture is fuel efficient, and so we call this fuel lean. Then, um, the, all the fuel will be consumed for complete conversion, and there will be some uh, oxygen left over. So the remaining oxygen mass fraction can then be calculated from this. Okay, let's assume it's fuel lean, and yf has to be zero. It's all consumed. And then you see I can solve this here for y02. Okay? So I can mul you multiply it by this and uh, uh, subtract this thing here and so on. And then uh, you can always replace uh, this denominator here with the z stoichiometric. So this denominator here, back to this, is y02 divided by z stoichiometric. Okay? So you can do this, you just uh, solve this here for y02 and you get this is equal to y02 times 1 minus z over z stoichiometric and uh, well we have this here okay now is this something missing here similarly if z is larger than z stoichiometric then it should say oxygen is deficient. Say this in your notes. Yeah. Oxygen is deficient and the mixture is called fuel rich. Then the exact same thing happens. I mean, just the opposite. You have then all the oxygen goes away and um, you can use this relation here to compute what is the fuel that's remaining. So you set oxygen to zero, and you just solve it for y fuel as function of z then, and you get this. Okay? And what you see here now, in the lean, fuel is zero. We get a, a, a certain function for y02. And then in the rich, the fuel is gone. You get a certain function of uh, y fuel. Okay? And so can plot these and do you need me? Um for your uh the breakdown if you keep going into the Yeah. So whatever your best is. Yeah. Okay. Oh. See, I'm uh, I used to teach student real students, okay? And um, undergraduate students for example, if you are one second over the time, <laughs> they start you putting things together. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> like this. And uh, so you immediately know if you go over time. <laughs> the graduate students are uh, a little better, but five minutes, I mean, that, uh, that was, would have pushed a little. So let's just stop here, and then we'll uh, uh, continue after the break. Um, yeah, let's do half, half an hour break. Or let's meet 25 minutes now, uh, because we started late also. Let's meet uh, back again at uh, quarter to 11.